So should I try something else? Um, I, th I think that's the way it's, it's meant to work. I know it's been, a, it's appearing at the bottom of the screen for Marsha and I as we go. Um, but is that, is it appearing at the bottom of your screen as well? Okay. Try, try the other, uh, try subtitle settings. Maybe that's what you're looking for. If you leave and rejoin, it also may be enabled for you because um, it is showing up for Marsha and I. Go ahead. I clicked on something else and now it's working. Oh, great. Oh, great. Great, great, great. All Thank right, you. Marcia, Marcia, Thank you, everybody rolling? else. Um, thanks for hanging in there with us as we get this uh, small Zoom issue taken care of. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for uh, exciting and kind of, I think, fun um, celebration of citizen science. I would like to introduce our dynamic guest, Caroline Nickerson. Um, Caroline is the Senior Program Director at SciStarter. Um, SciStarter is where she manages the Citizen Science Month program, SciStarter's Corporate Volunteer Program, and other outreach efforts, um, including um, Science Connected, Discover Magazine and Sci Starter platforms. She spends most days helping educators, library staff like myself, community leaders, and volunteers from all walks of life doing real life science. Caroline is a Master of Public Policy graduate from American University, where she was the Riley Environmental Policy Scholar, and she's a current PhD student at the University of Florida. Um, she also works with the University of Florida VA Bioethics Unit and the Christensen Project, Florida Community Innovation, and the Commission on Local Debates. She was the 2019 Cherry Blossom Princess representing the state of Florida and the Grand Prize Scholarship winner of the Miss Earth USA 2021 Miss Louisiana Earth. So I am so delighted to have you live um, to help us kick off citizen science this month. And I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Awesome, if you wanna get your screen fired up, but don't forget to share computer sound when you do. Um, as you do that, I just wanna say the pageant stuff, people always are like, huh? But one reason I'm really glad I did it is I got to make friends from all over the United States and the girls from Wisconsin were always some of the best. So I was really excited to zoom in with you all from Kenosha um, because I have, I have very fond thoughts of Wisconsin now thanks to those friendships I made. Um, but a huge thank you to Marsha for making this possible. Um, for all of you for troubleshooting with us, it's always great to have allies and um, we wanna make sure this experience is as good as it can be. Uh, so that's why I'm glad the closed captioning works now and thank you for your patience on that. And in that vein, in terms of making the experience as good as it can be, if at any point you have questions or just a thought, or you think, oh, if they explain this differently, it would resonate more with me, don't be shy. Feel free to just unmute and shout it out. You can also put it in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. Um, and this is really for you. Um, this is meant to be a resource for you. Uh, so don't be shy about making your voice heard. Um, that being said, this event is being recorded. So if you do unmute and shout things out and things like that, uh, it may end up in the recording. That recording will be publicly, publicly distrib distributed um, because other people want to get involved in this project because it's so cool. And actually, that's another reason why it's so great if you unmute and ask your question, because if you have, if you have a question, I bet you other people have that question as well. Uh, that being said, let's go to the next slide. So that's me in the wild uh, in my, my native Florida. Um, I'm outside now, I, I go outside as much as I can, but today we're gonna be doing an indoor project. So not to fear, you can do citizen science inside, outside, on your back porch. You can do citizen science anywhere in the world, but we'll go to the next slide. I wanted to go ahead and just put my contact info up there. If you have any issues with the project or you just have like an exciting citizen science win that you wanna share, you're welcome to email me anytime. That's my favorite part of my job. 
uh, getting to talk to volunteers from all over the world about how they're moving science forward. So don't be shy about getting in touch with me after either. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so to kind of kick things off, I just wanted to get some questions going. And I want to know, have you ever participated in citizen science before? And if you've never even heard the word, that's okay too. I just wanted to kind of see where people were at, if they'd ever done citizen science or even heard of it. Um, so I'll just pause here. Feel free to unmute and answer that question. Or you can also put it in the chat too. Yeah. I have not ever heard of citizen science and have not participated in citizen science. Oh my gosh. Well, you're going to learn everything you need to know to get started today. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, has anyone else, uh, anybody else want to share? Have they heard of citizen science? Have they ever actually done a project before? I have not heard of you or done a project. All right. That's good to know. I've heard the name and not done a project. All right, so we're all, oh my gosh, this is very exciting. We're all starting from a really good place. We'll go to the next slide. And I always wanna give people a chance to share a little bit about them if they fall into any of these categories. For example, if we have students, parents, teachers, library staff members, I, I know we have one, Marsha. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're a researcher, if you're just a bored person on the internet, or if you're none of these, I just want to pause here and see what categories you might fit into. I'm just a lifelong learner. I guess a per bored person. <laughs> there we go. We got a bored person here. We got a lifelong learner here. That's good. Um, well, hopefully you'll be entertained by this. And by the end, you'll be a citizen scientist. Yeah, I uh, was intrigued by the uh, citizen uh, participation in um, checking water pipe quality. Yeah. That's awesome. Great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired person uh, recently and uh, I guess trying to find something out there that uh, I can contribute to. That's amazing. Retirees are some of my favorite people to work with. I teach um, some classes with Osher occasionally, the Lifelong Learning Institute. And I would say retirees, you, you all, you, you do the reading, you do the homework, you always uh, come prepared. So I love that. Great, I think we'll go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna pass the mic to Marsha for a second, just to talk about what's been going on at the Kenosha Public Library and some of the cool kits that she has available for you to pick up. Thank you. Um, so in addition to this citizen science kickoff that you're gonna learn about the, the clean water at the tap, crowd the tap um, with the learning about collecting the data about our pipes, you're gonna learn about how, how that data will be used in really valuable ways. Um, but as part of this citizen science thing, um, we have kits that you'll be able to pick up that has a little uh, information kit in it with the data collection aspect of it, the water chemistry test, um, the city of Kenosha um, department, the water, pup, the water production uh, department has given us um, a bag that we can use to give out some free things. So they threw in a bag, a deck of cards and some, uh, some cool swag and also um, a, a, in a, a small but important piece of information um, on what to do if you go about finding out about your pipes and you find out something scary, like maybe you find something that might be lead or something that needs attention, they're ready. Um, they have some money, uh, some funds right now to help property owners so that you're not in this alone. They are ready to help you get this, get this fixed, but they need to hear it from you. So there's a little bit of information in there about what to do if, if through this process you find out something like that. So those kits are available at any of the four library branches or at any of the bookmobile stops or at Harbor Market. Um, if you can't make it to a branch, um, you know, for whatever reason, mobility or anything like that, you can call us and they'll, they'll transfer your phone call over to the outreach department 
and we have a day that we can go out and make deliveries, which is usually Thursday, but we'll work with your schedule. So um, those that's something that's exciting and, and really going to be an important part of this process. You're going to learn all about the process today, but you're going to want to get that kit to do the rest of the, um, the rest of the science. The other thing is that um, this program and the Crowd the Tap is really just one part of Citizen Science Month. We have a couple other really exciting um, things that we're doing. We did partner with the city of Kenosha. They are opening up the water production plant for in-person tours so you can see drinking water, um, what they're doing to make it safe and healthy for you. Um, it's been like seven or eight years since they opened up the plant um, to public. Um, they're also doing the same thing at um, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, they're going to have in-person tours for that. Um, we're having a little field trip over down by Lake Michigan at the watershed with the, in conjunction with the watershed program and Southport Park Association. Um, and then in a few weeks, uh, I believe two weeks from tonight, we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, session or you can drop in and Caroline will be back. I'll be back and we will help you with your own individual stuff. So if you've come, you've gotten your kit and now you're like, okay, now I need help submitting my data. We're gonna be back for that as well. So uh, we're, we're with you every step of the way and we hope that you really enjoy citizen science this month. Um, as a goal, the library will be doing citizen science at least a few times a year. Um, I am planning on bringing citizen science back again in January. I think we're going to do something about the science of baking. Ooh. So, I, <laughs> so I'm going to kick it. Can I, can I guess what project you're going to do? You can guess. Sourdough for science. Sourdough for science is definitely going to be one of them. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to kick it back to Caroline. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide. And that's the info about the next event. Um, we'll also include a link at the end um, up where you can RSVP for that. And like Marcia said, was, so we're, we really want this to be fun for you. We want you to be able to make a difference and learn something about your water. So this, um, if you don't get what you need during this event, we will be back again. Or you can just come and say hi at the next event to help you submit all your data. So let's go to the next slide. So you're hearing this word, right? You're like citizen science, citizen science, citizen science. And you might be wondering what on earth is it? So very broadly, citizen science is a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned and motivated to make a difference. Anybody, anywhere of any age, I worked with people who are five years old. I worked with people who are nearly a hundred. Anyone can be a citizen scientist. Um, you do citizen science when you volunteer to move science forward. Uh, most often, people are collecting or analyzing data for an ongoing research project, like the one you're gonna learn about tonight. Um, and data is just information. So you can collect data for a project by taking a picture of a bird in your backyard, sending that to a researcher, telling them what type of bird it was and where you found it. That helps them monitor the population of that bird. That picture you took becomes a data point. It becomes a way to understand a global issue. Um, you can also analyze data with a citizen science project. Uh, one project that's one of my favorites, it's called Stall Catchers. It's an online game where by playing this online game, you're actually making annotations for Alzheimer's researchers who are trying to understand the, you know, this condition that impacts people you likely know and love. I know my family's been touched by it. And every time I'm able to participate in that project, not only do I have fun, by playing the game, but I feel great because I know that I'm making annotations to move this research forward. I just gave you two project examples, right? I talked about monitoring bird populations by reporting what you see and um, helping speed up Alzheimer's research by playing a game to make annotations. Those two examples are just the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of citizen science projects out there that have been started by university professors, our nonprofits, our governments, are sometimes just concerned citizens. To give another example, um, there's a woman in Hawaii um, that she, she emailed me a few months ago. Um, she didn't really have a scientist, she wasn't with a university or anything like that. She didn't have any formal support, but she really loves monarch butterflies. And she wanted to grow milkweed in her garden, grow their food source in her garden so she could help the monarch butterflies. 
but she didn't know what soil conditions would be best to grow this milkweed. So she went, she did all the research. She set up her own protocol. A pro- protocol is just another word for instructions. She set up her own protocol. She put it on SciStarter. And now people across Hawaii are joining her project and going through the, te- the steps to test their soil to figure out what soil is best for milkweed so they can help the monarch butterflies. You know, anyone can do citizen science and lots of people from all different walks of life have started their own projects and then leverage the power of the crowd. The reason I do citizen science, I don't, um, I didn't have a scientific background when I first got started, you know, in undergrad, when I was an undergraduate student, I was studying, you know, history, but I started volunteering as a citizen scientist because I, even though I didn't think science was for me, I loved being outside and I was a very curious person. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I can do science. I don't have to be Einstein. You don't have to be a genius to do science. You just have to have, be willing to follow the instructions and make a difference. Um, so if tonight's project, you know, if you, if you do it and you're like, hey, I want to do more science. There are thousands of projects out there and you can turn your curiosity about the world into real impact by joining these citizen science projects. So we'll go to the next slide. And the best way to find citizen science projects is SciStarter. We, um, so I work at SciStarter. I ended up volunteering my way into a job, but um, we have a community of over 100,000 citizen scientists volunteers who have made accounts um, and they're able to explore over 3,000 projects, events, and tools that researchers have added to SciStarter for them to discover. Um, so uh, a researcher, a project leader, they'll add their project to SciStarter when they need volunteers. There are so many projects that scientists can't do without your help. And then volunteers come to SciStarter when they wanna make a difference. It's a way for them to find the project that piques their curiosity. Maybe they're really into astronomy and they find a project where they're able to you know, map spiral galaxies from their own home. Um, maybe they are really curious about the brain and they wanna understand it better. And they join a project that allows them to um, make annotations for mental health researchers. Um, if the, there is a citizen science project out there for everyone. I mean, in January, Marsha's gonna have you all making sourdough to study the science of microbes. So you, you can definitely find something here that will be not only enjoyable for you, but will allow you to make a difference. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, another resource that I, has been popular for folks who wanna dive in, I thought I'd give it a quick shout out before I got into the project specific stuff for tonight is our training. And we created this because we also wanted a way to give back to the citizen science community. Because when you're doing citizen science, you know, you're learning things about the subject matter. Um, you're learning about the science of microbes and sourdough, or you're learning about, um, you know, water chemistry with this particular project we're gonna do tonight. Um, but you also are showing really amazing skills like attention to detail, um, the passion that you're showing, you're the willingness to make a difference. So we created a badge. So if you want a little bit more of an extended intro to citizen science at your own pace, we have this training at SciStarter.org forward slash training. The reason we're called SciStarter is it's you're starting the science, SciStarter. Um, we have that website, um, the training site up. So you can click through it, do the course and get a free badge. Um, and you can put that badge, you can print it out. Um, some people have embedded it on different online profiles for bragging rights. Um, but it's totally up to you and it's our way of giving back. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so another resource I wanted to quickly shout out, if you're hearing all this stuff and you're thinking, okay, water chemistry is cool. I'm really excited to do water chemistry tonight. But I also really love, you know, let's say um, Costa Rica. I've always wanted to go and I've never been able to go. You could search the word Costa Rica in the SciStarter Project Finder. And believe it or not, there's a project on SciStarter called Instant Wild where you're able to look at pictures that researchers have taken and class, so they, there are these things, I'm getting off topic, but I'm just really excited. There are these things called camera traps. So researchers will just put up a camera and um, leave it there. Um, and the camera trap will take a picture whenever an animal wanders by. And you can actually look through those photos and classify different animals for many research projects that are list, listed on SciStarter to help researchers monitor their populations. And for some of these creatures, like. Um, there's one project called Snapshot Serengeti. Um, the, the zebras might be, you know, a, a threatened population. So by doing this project, you're helping researchers have an accurate indication of how zebras are doing or how other species are doing. That's just one example. So 
there's a whole universe out there and you can search for projects on the Finder as well. Let's go to the next slide. But if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, you're like, oh my gosh, 3000 projects, that is too much for me. Well, number one, you're in the right place because we're just gonna talk about one project tonight and kind of a deep dive. But number two, there's a special microsite that I always like to give shout outs when we do events with libraries like the awesome Kenosha Public Library. There are about 10 projects on this page, scistarter.org forward slash NLM, that the National Library of Medicine said are a particularly good fit for libraries and people who go to libraries. Um, so on this page, it's kind of your one stop if you're a little overwhelmed by all the other thousands of options. On this page, you can make your SciStarter account and you can find tonight's featured project as well as a link to that training I mentioned. So if you take away nothing else, this URL is very helpful to you because it gets you started. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, now we have a video. I'm gonna go on mute for the next minute. Think of this as kind of your movie trailer. Um, one of the researchers who works on this project made this video, um, so enjoy. When you think about the waterways of our country, you probably think about rivers, creeks, and streams. But tucked away just a few feet underground is a different kind of waterway, the 1.2 million miles of pipes that provide us with easy access to drinking water. While most of these pipes are owned by water utilities, the piping between the water main and our faucet is actually the property of the homeowner. Learning about the pipe materials supplying water to your home can help you manage the quality of your water. My name is Imani Bell. I'm a researcher working on Crowd the Tap. Your pipes can be made of steel, copper, plastic, or lead. Knowing which pipe provides your water is important because certain pipes, like lead pipes, can impact your health. So get to know your pipes and inform us of your findings by joining Crowd the Tap. For this project, I want you to first find your pipe and put a magnet against it. If it sticks, your pipe is steel. If it doesn't, scratch the surface of the pipe with a penny. If there is no shine when you scratch it, it's plastic. If it scratches the same color as the penny, it's probably made from copper. If it scratches silver or gray, you probably have lead pipes. But even if the pipes in your home don't have lead, you also need to know what the utility's pipes are made of. We will provide you with a script to ask your utility what makes up their pipes. Thank you for providing information about your pipes. With enough observations, we can make safer drinking water for everyone and empower people to use science to make change. All right, and Marsha, if you want to pause it real quick. When you think about- ah, No worries. All right, we're going to pause there really quick because um, we actually have another video where I did the test, but I really quickly wanted to speak on that. So that was a kind of rapid fire introduction to the project. So in a nutshell, the Crowd the Tap project, it's based out of NC State University um, and it's funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. This project, it really, one thing we like to say at SciStarter is scientists don't have enough eyes, ears, and perspectives to know everything there is to know, to understand everything that needs to be understood, um, to answer every question that we need to answer. Um, and something like water, you know, it's so important. I think we all care about water, the water we drink. Um, and so the thing about the Crowd the Tap project is they feasibly, they couldn't go door to door, you know, they couldn't knock on your door and say, hey, can I test your pipes? Um, they need people like you, community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, to test your pipes, um, to understand what they're made of, to do it, an inventory of drinking water infrastructure, because um, lead is a toxin. Um, it's very dangerous to humans. Um, and it's not the end of the world. If there's lead in your pipes, there are things you can do. Marsha talked about that. You all are so lucky in Kenosha that you have people on standby to help you out in case you see something scary. Um, but even if your pipes aren't made of lead, it's still really important for you to submit your data um, so um, we can understand what's going on. It's basically a census of water pipes. Um, so this project, I'm so ha happy that it's a SciStarter affiliate because I get to speak on it um, and do it. Um, and I actually did it this morning. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so that's the picture from the video. And just as a reminder, you can find the project at scistarter.org forward slash NLM. You can click on that crowd the tap icon. And if I go too fast tonight, are you, you know, you want to look at the instructions in between now and when we meet again for the next event, there are step-by-step -step instructions on that page as well under the crowd the tap project. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the project leader, Dr. Karen Cooper. She's one of my heroes. Um, I love that I get to work with her at SciStarter. She has two citizen science books. 
Um, one of them was actually co-authored with the founder of SciSparter, Darlene Cavalier. Um, uh, one of them is the Field Guide to Citizen Science. That's uh, Darlene and Karen's book. The other one is Citizen Science, where it's kind of like a history of the whole field. So in between, you know, basically the invention of science, the present, how members of the public have always been involved moving science forward. Uh, many of the slides that you'll see, she um, developed for an event we did together. So I just wanted to give her a shout out and give credit where credit is due. And that is her Twitter handle up there. I don't know if any of you are on social media, but you can find her as well at CoopSciScoop. And that's also her dog, Buttercup. Um, Buttercup fe features frequently in our Zoom calls. So I figured we'd throw her up there as well. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so drinking water. Do you trust that the drinking water in your home is safe? And do you know what types of pipes are in your home delivering drinking water? Um, this is a kind of a timeline of different drinking water laws. And the thing that's really interesting to me is the reduction of lead in drinking water act was only um, came about in 2014. Um, so it's relatively recently, you know, within our lifetimes that we've been thinking about this issue. And that's why there are so many lead pipes, right? Um, it's because it was part of our water infrastructure for a very long time since we got things going. And most of the laws that were addressing water were things that were addressing like pollution. I don't know if you all can see behind me, but like in the rivers, um, it wasn't really the law. Our legal minds, um, our, our leaders weren't really thinking about water in homes. They were thinking about like, oh my gosh, I see pollution in the stream. Let's address it. Things like that. Um, so this is a relatively recent thing. And you all are, you're part of the solution now. And you're part of understanding what's going on on the ground. So that's something to really be excited about. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so how do you participate? This is one of those awesome projects where um, there are different levels. So anybody can participate in level one as long as they have a penny and a magnet. You can participate if you live in an apartment, if you live in a condo, if you live in a standalone house, if you live in a townhome, anybody can do level one and test their pipes with a simple scratch test and a simple magnet test. Level two, you all have a unique opportunity to participate in because Marsha acquired these kits for you for free through the Kenosha Public Library. And like she mentioned, if you want them to, if the outreach team to bring one to you, that's an option as well, which I think is really cool. And then you, um, 12 of you from the Kenosha Public Library will have the option to do level three, where you're actually able to fill up a bottle of your water and send it off to Dr. Cooper's lab for her to test it for you. Um, and the reason there are multiple levels to this is level one gives us a good idea. It's kind of a basic census of what your pipes are made of. Level two gives us a more granular idea of what your pipes, um, what's going on with your pipes. And level three gives us the most definitive idea. Um, so level one, I hope everyone in the United States does, does it. That would be my dream. Level two, I hope enough communities do it that we get a better idea. So um, I would love for, you know, 100 people in Kenosha to do it. That would be awesome. And level three, um, 12 of you doing it is a really great sample for us to better understand the problem. Um, and you might be wondering, well, if I did level one, I found out my pipes were made of copper. Why would I need to do level two or level three? I know my pipes are made of copper. Uh, I don't mean to scare you, but even if your pipe pipes are made of copper, there could be some soldering, some like some materials in there that could still be lead, even though the majority of the pipe is copper. Um, and there could be other things going on there too. So it's really good that we have this test that tests for 14 different things with those strips, as well as level three, where they're running it, you know, through a more thorough test. So you still don't get the complete picture when you do level one. So we'll go to the next slide. Oops, sorry, there we go. Oh, no worries. Uh, let's, that was the last one. There we go. All right, so now we have a demo. So full disclosure, my dad filmed this this morning. Um, I told him to get me in the picture and he just got my knees. So you can't get, get, get good help these days. That's what I get for free. I wanted him to take it again and he said no. Um, so I wanted to reveal that to you all. Um, before we play these, I just want to pause and see if there are any questions or thoughts so far. No. All right. Anybody else? Any, any ideas people have or anything that's been sparked for you so far? No worries. We'll have plenty of time for questions as we go. And don't forget, you have that chat box there where if something comes to you like mid video, you can throw it in that chat box too. Um, but anyway, Marsha, uh, let's roll the first one. Hey everybody, I'm Caroline from SciStarter and I'm about to show you how to test your pipes with the CrowdTap project. 
as you can see, I live in Florida and our service lines tend to be located outside. The service line is what brings all the water into your house from the water utility. Um, if you live in an apartment, your service line may be somewhere else. It might be next to your water heater. Um, if you're in the Northeast, maybe it's in your basement. Uh, it just depends on where you are in the world where your service line is. And if you have any questions like, um, along those lines, I encourage you to call your water utility provider. So I'm gonna do a simple test with a magnet and a penny to understand what my service line is made out of. So to make sure this magnet works, I'm gonna test this right here. So this is the lid that usually covers up my service line. And I know that this lid is made of iron and iron is magnetic. So you can see that this magnet does indeed work. Now here is my service line. We're gonna test it. Oh my gosh, it's not sticking. If it had stuck, I would probably think my line was made out of steel or maybe iron, but it's not sticking. Um, so it's probably made either out of plastic, copper, or lead. Now to confirm that, I'm gonna do a scratch test with this penny. So I scratch it and it reveals a kind of um, penny color texture right there. So I know it's copper. Also, I additionally know that copper tends to corrode when it's in water, it tends to turn green. And uh, because the service line has been underwater outdoors, um, it has corroded and it has turned green. If um, it had been plastic, you know, nothing would have really happened. Nothing would have been revealed by the scratch. Um, if it had been lead, I would have seen some silvery streaks there. Um, and when you're participating in this, you know, take safety precautions. Don't get too close, especially if it's made out of lead, uh, because you don't want to breathe in any type of lead, because lead is a toxin and it's dangerous to humans. All right, now I'm going to go inside. Now that I've tested my service line, which is the main line that brings water into the house, I'm going to see um, what my uh, other pipes are made out of, the little pipes that bring water up into my sink. So I'll see. All right, let's roll the next one. All right, now we are inside. We're looking at the interior water line here. We want the tiny one because we, it's small like that. It's about the size of a finger uh, because of water pressure. It needs to be that small, you know, to get water up in there um, and to, you know, work with the, with the physics of that. That big one right there, we don't care much, as much about that because it's taking water out. Um, so we had tested the service line and now we're testing the interior line to know, you know, what we're drinking and to get a fuller picture. This looks about the same as my service line outside, so I already have a sense that it's made of copper. I also see some corrosion there. But I'm going to do the same test I did last time. It's not sticking. The magnet is not sticking, so we know it's not magnetic. And we're going to do the scratch test again. Yep, and I see a penny color material there revealed by the scratch test, so we know it, this is indeed copper. To understand whether or not um, there's any lead at all, maybe in the soldering or in any of the materials there, I'll want to do a water test later with some strips, but I don't have that yet. So my friend Brian Mallow, the science community comedian, is going to walk you through it. Thanks for being here with me. All right, before we go to the next slide, um, just to kind of recap, the service line is the first thing you want to test because that's what brings water into your home. If you have issues identifying your service line, that's why we have the help session um, next time. So we'll be able, you could even take us on Zoom and with your laptop and walk around your house and we could try to find the service line with you. You can also just call your utility company. And that's the first thing you want to test because that's what's bringing water into your home. And then you'll also want to test some of the pipes that are, you know, putting water up in your sink. And like you saw in the video, those pipes are small because of water pressure. To get it actually up there, it does need to be small, about the size of a finger. And that's how you're able to tell it apart from, you know, those bigger pipes that are bringing water out of the house. Um, any questions before we um, go over the test strips? No if you're confused, awesome. Okay, that's good. I'm glad everything's been clear so far. And if you get confused or you can't remember, if you're like, wait, what does it look like when I scratch the lead pipe again? Um, there are graphics on that Crowd the Tap webpage I've told you all about, the SciStarter.org forward slash NLM, and on the forum as well. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice graphic. They did a really good job designing it. It's like, if it sticks, it's steel. Um, if it reveals a, a penny-like texture, it's copper. You know, if nothing happens, it's plastic. Uh, and if you, you know, you see um, shiny streaks, it's lead. So they're, they're really good about helping you test that. All right, let's go to the next slide. Go. Oh. 
everybody. Sorry. Sorry. No worries. Restarted the video. Classic hazards of Zoom. There um, we go. That's what, awesome. And that's where you'll report your data. So when you go from that scistarter.org forward slash NLM page, there are five different tabs. And um, because you all do have those special kits, you'll be able to report data for all of the tabs. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is Brian. He is a science comedian. That is his actual profession. Um, but he's actually not telling jokes in this one because um, he's just telling you how to use those test strips. So we're gonna go ahead and play. Welcome to Crowd the Tap. I'm Brian Mallow, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use the at-home test strip to explore the chemistry of the tap water in your home. So this video is for people who received kit number one from a partner organization. And it's a very simple kit. It just consists of the test strip and this brochure. You'll need to provide a glass of tap water from your home, and just make sure it's tall enough that you can dunk all 14 of the test squares underwater. You'll also need a pen, and a device to keep time with. I'm gonna use the stopwatch on my cell phone. And you'll also need a phone or a camera to take one picture of your results. The brochure also has step-by-step -step instructions as well as other information about the project. And on the other side, there's a legend or key that we're gonna to use to interpret the results of the test along with the water chemistry table. So we'll record our data here, then we'll go to the Crowd the Tap website and add it to the questionnaire along with the information about the pipes in our homes. So let's begin. We'll start by writing our name in the rectangle under the colored squares. Next, fill a glass with water from your tap. One end of the test strip is a handle. It has no tests on it. So holding it by the handle, Dip your test strip in your water for five seconds. And when you remove it, don't shake it or wipe off the excess water. Just lay it down on the table, start your timer, and we're gonna let the water react with the chemistry test for 60 seconds. While it's doing that, I'd like to point out that this test strip is off the shelf. It wasn't custom made for Crowd the Tap. It has 14 different tests on it, and you'll notice one of them is for lead, but this test on its own is not considered accurate enough for their purposes. So the way they're going to use it is by combining this information with the other information you provided about the pipes in your home and certain characteristics of the water and your house and demographic questions. Using all of that together, they're going to build a statistical model to make reliable estimates of the relative level of risk of finding lead in your drinking water. So it's been 60 seconds. Place the test strip in the black rectangle next to all the colored squares. Now, in each row, compare the color of the test result to the options provided by the legend and choose the one that's the closest match. And write the number in the square at the end of the row. Now, for each row, take the number and find the corresponding number in the water chemistry table and then circle the value associated with it. Do that for all of them. Take a photo of the test strip and the boxes you filled out. You really only need what's within the black rectangle. Now we're gonna to go to crowdthetap.org and enter our data. Click on report data. Then the last tab, your chemistry. Now, enter all the values you circled on the water chemistry table. Then upload your photo. And if you have kit number two, the water collection bottles, you can hit save and finish it later. This is where you'll enter your lab results once you receive them. But for most people, just hit submit form and you're done. Good job. From everyone at SciStarter and Crowd the Tap, thank you for your participation. And you might be wondering, what is this crowdthetap.org? It just redirects you to the SciStarter form we've been talking about, so not to worry there. Um, but you, you all are able to do all five tabs. You know, you're able to do the scratch test with that penny and that magnet. Um, there are also some other questions on there. The form asks you about like what your water tastes like, um, it ha if it has a certain smell to it. 
um, they ask you some questions about how old your, you know, your home is. Um, and if you're in an apartment, if you know you're in a standalone home, um, so and things like that. So you're able to do all those tabs um, with the um, the two the kit Marsh is giving you, as well as with a penny and a magnet. Uh, and there's an optional level three that's going to be open to 12 people in Kenosha. Um, and Brian made a video for that too about how to fill up your water and send it to the lab. I think we have time for it, Marsha, if you want to go to the next one and play it. Welcome to Crowd the Tap. I'm Brian uh, Mallet. No, it's, there we go. <laughs> no worries. Welcome to Crowd the Tap. I'm Brian Mallow, and this video is for citizen scientists who have received kit number two, the water collection bottles, from a partner organization. We're going to use this kit to take three different samples of your tap water, which will be sent to a lab and analyzed for the presence of lead. Everything you need is in the kit, except a pen and a timekeeping device. I'm going to use the stopwatch on my phone. Now, this project is easy, but it's important that you follow the instructions carefully. So when you get the kit, before you start, please read the complete instructions and watch this video till the end. The most important thing to know is that we want you to sample your water after it's been sitting in your pipes motionless for at least six hours. That means for six hours, no one in the house can use any running water, not the kitchen sink or any other faucets, no baths or showers, no toilets flushing, no dishwasher or washing machine, no hoses outside. So you might want to do this first thing in the morning after everyone's been asleep or after work if no one's been home. Just make sure no one has used any water in the house for six hours or more. Okay, let's begin. When you're ready to start, have your clock ready. It might be useful to have someone keep time for you, but I'm going to do it myself and make a video at the same time. So I'm sure you can do it too. First, take all three bottles out of the box. and remove their caps. Because once we turn on the water, we are not turning it off again until we get all three samples. Keep the Ziploc baggie in the box because you'll be using them to return your samples. And the only other thing in the box is the instructions, which you'll read carefully and fill out the section that asks for your name, address, and contact info so the lab can send you your test results. This will be going back into the box to be returned as well. And before you start, Fill out your contact info on the first and biggest bottle. Now, we're only going to use the cold water tap, not the hot. And when we turn it on, we're going to turn it up to a high flow rate, like you're filling a pitcher of water. We're going to start with bottle number one, the biggest bottle. But we want to make sure we catch the very first water that comes out of the faucet. So first put the bottle under the faucet and then turn it on and fill it. When it's full, put it aside and start your timer. We're going to wait 45 seconds and keep the water flowing. That first sample caught the water in the pipes right here in my house, but the next two samples will be water farther down the line. After waiting 45 seconds, fill your second bottle. Put it aside and start your timer again. This time we're going to wait two minutes. Don't turn off the tap, let it flow. After two minutes, fill the last smallest bottle. Now we can turn off the water and put the caps on the bottles. Make sure you tighten them really well. Now there's one more thing I want to show you to help you repack your kit. These bottles will fit easily enough into the Ziploc baggie, but in order to fit the whole thing into the box nicely, there's a little trick. Put the biggest bottle in first, and then the second biggest bottle, and the smallest bottle needs to rest on its side on top of the second one. And then zip this shut 
and try to make it airtight. You'll see when you place them in the box, you may have to manipulate the little bottle to make it fit, but it fits. And make sure you put in the instructions with your information filled out back into the box. Tape it shut and return it to the partner organization that gave it to you. They'll ship it to the lab and the lab will send you the results of their analysis. And the final step, when you receive the lab results, go back to the CrowdLatap website, go to report data, and on the last tab, your chemistry, scroll down to the bottom and enter the data for your three bottles. And that's it. Now it's up to the scientists to take all this data gathered by citizen scientists like you and build a statistical model to help predict the risk of finding lead in our drinking water. And it wouldn't have been possible without you. So once again, on behalf of SciStarter and Crowd the Tap, thank you for your participation. All right, that's pretty much everything in a nutshell. Let's go to the next slide really quick. Welcome to Crowd the oh. Tap. I'm Did Brian again. Mallow and it's all good. So really quickly to kind of close this out, this really does make a difference. There have been research outcomes of this project already. They've had the most uptake in North Carolina um, because you know, that's where it's got started. But you all could have just as robust research outcomes in Kenosha if you get your friends and family to do those scratch tests. They don't even have to do levels two and three. They don't need to do the, the strips or send the water to the lab. I mean, hopefully they do the strips because I know Marsha has a bunch of kits for you now. Um, but they could just do level one and it would still make a really big difference. Um, but we found that, uh, and the project found, so Dr. Cooper's lab, um, that there are a lot of counties in North Carolina that have um, lead um, in their water pipes. And uh, so about 10 million people are impacted um, by this. And the counties that are most severely impacted have a higher percentage of residents who are black, are white people who are in poverty. And they also, there are also more, more children um, who are in counties that have water services that are impacted by lead. Um, so they're already seeing results from this. They're already getting a better understanding of drinking water infrastructure by having people participate. And you all could be next. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so I also wanted to give a quick shout out because you can only really do this project where, where you live once. I mean, I suppose you could go to all your friends' houses and just test all their pipes. Um, and you know what, that'd be awesome if you wanna do that. But there are other projects that you can do. So I wanted to give my top two recommendations. I think the stall catchers project is a lot of fun and you can do it from anywhere where you have access to the internet. You can do it on a tablet, you can do it on a smartphone, you can do it on your computer. Uh, and just by playing this simple game, you can accelerate Alzheimer's research. Um, we'll go to the next slide. You can also do the IC change project. This is another one of my favorites. I actually, I do it a lot. I'm in South Florida right now. And um, I will take pictures of water I see piling up on the sidewalk and submit it to IC Change because IC Change asks anybody anywhere from anywhere in the world to document the real life effects of climate change and environmental problems to help contribute to solutions. Um, so if, you, if it's been uncommonly hot in your area or uncommonly cold, or if you notice it raining a bunch um, and overwhelming your, your infrastructure in your community, or um, maybe you know, the seasons are coming a little earlier that year, Whatever you observe in your community about the environment based on your lived experience, I see change wants to know. Um, to give an example from my neck of the woods, they forged a partnership with the city of Miami where people, if they report um, flooding that they see, because um, the streets flood pretty commonly here in Florida, um, any flooding that you see, if you report it to IC Change, the city is able to know, oh, maybe we should target this area for infrastructure development. So that's a formal partnership they have to understand the problem and come to solutions together. Um, so that's another project where if you contributed, if a bunch of people contributed in Kenosha, you'd have a really great snapshot of what's going on with your local environment. Um, and you can find both those projects, Stall Catchers and IC Change on SciStarter. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, and just to recap, the webpage where you're able to find the Crowd the Tap project, as well as the two projects I just showed you, and make your SciStarter account is SciStarter.org forward slash NLM. I think this will be a great resource to you. Um, because you'll on the crowd the tap icon when you click that you'll be able to get diagrams about um, you know what you see when your pipes lead what you see when your pipes plastic things like that just helpful tips and tricks as you're using that penny and that magnet to complete step one um, we'll go to the next slide uh, and now I, I think we have about five minutes left 
So we'll just quickly pause for questions or thoughts. Um, anybody want to share? Uh, Ka Caroline, this is Jean. I, ha I have uh, a sister who has water from a well. Would, would a water sample from their home be worthwhile? Yes, um, if you have water from a well, there's an area on the form where you're able to report the well casing info. Okay. So she's, you know, she's part of the puzzle, right? You know, right. we're all different pieces of the puzzle of our water infrastructure. So she's definitely, I, I'd love if she participated too. That'd be great. Okay, go pick up an extra kit. <laughs> awesome. I just want to um, remind everyone now that um, we have these uh, bags from the, ooh, let's see, Nosha Water Utility. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I've got the blur going on my professional screen here. So this um, kit or bag that you can stop at any of the library branches or any bookmobile stop, or if you're not mobile and can't get to a branch, give us a call and ask for the outreach department. We'll bring it. So the, the, Kenosha Water Utility has that cool stuff in it. And then also in this kit, I actually have provided a penny and a magnet for you to go with the, um, the form that you saw Brian fill out, which was the water chemistry. So it it's, um, comes in this professional looking um, envelope from the uh, North Carolina State University. You open it up inside there, your water chemistry kit is inside there. And then I've also included a penny and a magnet so you can do part one. And then the next part would be the water chemistry. Um, I don't have yet those 12 water kits that can get sent in, um, but I believe they're coming from Dr. Cooper. So um, by the time we meet again, maybe in two weeks, I'm hoping I'll have um, gotten those uh, 12 kits, but I'll probably just do, you know, the first 12 people um, that were able, you know, to go through the process. Or we'll just see how it goes if I actually get those kits. So, um, so don't forget that the next part of the of your science journey is going to be stopping at one of the library branches, getting a hold of this bag that has the uh, the next part of your science in it. I'll turn it back over to Caroline. Yeah, and I, I think it's good that you all do level two and level one first anyway before doing level three, because that one's a little bit more intense. The fact that you have to, you know, wake up first thing in the morning or do it while after everybody's been at work, you know, the six hour requirement. So we'll start small, you know, the penny and the magnet is a great place to start and then you can escalate from there. And you can also come to our health se help session next week. It's almost like office hours and um, we can just figure out where we're at and chat. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, that's our next event, just as a reminder. Um, and then you can find that on Kenosha Public Library's website, as well as on SciStarter's events. And we'll go to the yeah. next slide. This is our next virtual event. Um, we do have the in-person field trip next week at Southport Park. That's the um, watershed um, Lake Michigan uh, family field trip. It's all ages. It's um, adults, teens, seniors, kids, anyone. Um, but registration is required because they are going to be um, trying to get together the supplies that they're going to need for the evening. So here's the next one. Awesome. And then we have a survey. Oh, let's go back. Oh, sorry. No worries. Yeah. I'm going to put the, the link to the survey in the chat. It is case sensitive, so capitalization matters. Um, so I'll just put that in there. That survey allows you, if there's anything else you, you want to know, or if you have any um, tips that you want to share with us to improve the next event, or you just want to give us feedback, um, the survey is there for you in the chat. Um, it's bit.ly, um, capital K, Kenosha, capital S survey. And it looks like we are perfectly at time. Any final questions yes. or thoughts before we go? No, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank you all for, partic for participating this evening. Um, as we stated at the beginning, this session was recorded. Thank you, Caroline, for allowing us to do that. Um, I will be um, getting this video um, edited a little bit at the beginning and the end. 
and we'll be getting a link out onto our social media um, and it'll be on the Kenosha Public Library YouTube channel. So if you thought this was a valuable session, you wanna tell your friends and family about it, um, they should be able to go and hopefully just um, a day or two, it should be up and ready for them to be able to watch this entire program in full. Thanks, good resource. All right. Thanks. Well, stop by the Kenosha Public Library website if you're interested in doing some more of the citizen science. Again, we have the field trip next week. Um, there's a book club um, about the, the uh, book Poisoned Water. And um, they have those book, books available for pickup at the Southwest Branch right now. Um, and then we do have the tours coming up of the Kenosha Water Utility, the water production plant and the um, wastewater plant. And um, then in two weeks, we'll meet again with Caroline online. So hopefully you'll have picked up your kit before then, but if you don't, you can still log in that day and we're gonna have volunteers that'll be, be able to help you one-on-one -on -one with your particular situation. So if you're having trouble because you can't find your water main or something like that, we're gonna have trained volunteers that'll be able to help you one-on-one -on -one virtually. And then um, for the rest of the month, just keep your eye open uh, for the Kenosha Public Library social media. We'll be uh, sending out lots of interesting facts. And um, thank you for your participation from Kenosha Public Library and from the city of Kenosha, Kenosha Water Utility. They were very excited and thrilled um, to be our partner with this citizen science. Awesome, thank you, Marsha. <laughs> and yeah, everybody go ahead, get started. Don't be scared. And even if you do everything and you have no problems, you can just come to the next session and say hello too. That's yeah, fine. We'll, as well love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>